So, welcome to uh, a technical deep dive. I titled this uh, Recognizing a Sea of Spaces in Storage Wonderland. And uh, let me take you on to a small journey um, into Wonderland. So, um, just to recap, what is, is OwnCloud Infinite Scale? Uh, it is a rewrite of uh, the backend uh, of OwnCloud in Golang. Um, but it's actually not something that we started. Uh, CERN has uh, really, uh, and who especially, started writing and experimenting with the different alternatives to a PHP backend uh, or as, as early as 2018. Um, and it aims to solve some really nasty problems. Um, um, we've now, we are now at, uh, I think, the 13th release. Um, so this is already outdated, this slide. Um, but uh, before I really start talking, uh, I would like to uh, get your input. Um, let me paste that Miro link in the chat. Um, that is an interactive uh, board, and I'll go there in a moment. Um, I hope all of you will join me there to, um, yeah, gather some feedback on what actually, when did you guys actually start using OCloud? So you can, if you log into this, uh, maybe I need to go to and send you the password in the chat as well. That is uh, today 20. Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Now, did I not send that password? Twenty. Oh, my connection is lost. Great. So the password is today twenty twenty one. I hope you can still okay, so it was typed. And I hope I will see you all in here. Ooh, nice. Okay. Uh please pick your pick a button. You can drag these buttons around. Um and I actually had my first uh, deployment in I don't know, very early on. <laughs> I started with 4.5, I think. Um just grab one of those buttons and put them into the boxes at the top and um, just so that we have a small overview of where you started um, using OwnCloud. Um, I'll give you some time for that. Um, and I hope if you think about, okay, what did I do when I started this? How long did it take to... Uh, update, how long, did, what did I have to do? That there are already some ideas coming for you or coming to your mind on um, what actually were some of the problems you encountered. Um, and I see that, yeah, it's spread pretty, uh, interestingly, pretty even. Um, so we, over the course of the past 10 years, OwnCloud has learned quite substantially how to deal with the database, how to handle a Galera cluster. Uh, the research community um, has um, exchanged ideas of how to best run a Galera cluster. And the, today's deployment of a bigger in, OwnCloud instance usually uh, involves having a Galera cluster. Um, I see that people are already moving to the um, next frame. So let's go there. Um, but how does that work? Oh, I can, okay, I'll use the keyboard, that do. Um, so that's the second question. What were the most annoying problems that you encountered um, when, yeah, up running OwnCloud in production. 
um, just you know, pick one of these yellow uh, post-its, uh, copy them, paste, and you can add the ones you want. That's that's totally fine. Um, I hope you can all um, you can all use this tool, uh, but it seems to be intuitive enough. Um, so I see that ooh, the file cache. Counts for 3,000. <laughs> yeah. Um, file cache, performance, S3 performance, activity history in the database. Yeah. Um, waiting times and uploading many small files. Uh, logs are hard to understand. OK, that's interesting. I can probably go into that. Um, External storage is in a performant way. That's an interesting one. Uh, shibboleth, okay. Does nobody of you have had any problems with deploying it or you know managing dependencies or anything? But um, performance shibboleth. Okay, any problems with uh, other other user backends? Okay, sharing in ACLs. Oh, that's interesting. So you want to be able to um, natively uh, set ACLs on the files. That means integrating um, own cloud with the underlying operating system. Mm hmm. NFS syncs are slow, right? Oh, yeah, changing usernames. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I'll get to that. <laughs> ah, usability UI. Okay. I, I mean, I hope that there have been a lot of, um, I hope you've seen the the, the talk from um, the web team about the UI and accessibility. Um, so, external storage is okay. Bad performance on large deployments. Mm. Yep. So there is nothing that really uh, is new to me here. Um, <laughs> to the rescue, uh, yeah, cool. I will, I will switch back. Um, feel free to post uh, to add more posts there. Uh, I will go back to the slides. Um, I think I started writing down the problems that we have with OSIS in, I don't know, two years, three years ago. Uh, there are issues. Uh, that are five years old in the GitHub issue tracker about um, some inefficiencies uh, in the file cache table, that it's um, a huge table for all metadata that's duplicate. Um, so, and with OSIS, we really try to address, address these problems on an architectural level. There are some other changes that come along. So we're changing from a script language to a compiled language. Um, the script language has some limitations or some drawbacks. It's a little bit slow um, compared to compiled languages. Uh, it may, may not be as secure as a compiled language because you could just hack at stuff. It's a two double-edged sword. You can, of course, quickly fix stuff. Um, but if you are in a big, de big deployment, you don't really want to fix stuff in production that it feels bad for all parties. Um, there's also, I, I saw some stuff about Shibboleth. Um, so let me dig into the identity management management part because I see, I think there is something that we can look into. Uh, database and storage inconsistencies were mentioned. Um, and there's really no data sharding. So there were posts about um, adding external storages and performance problems um, that ultimately um, is caused by having a single large file cache table. You could shard that, 
but um, that makes the setup even more complex. And with OSIS, we're going to address this, that on an API level. So um, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Um, I would like to motivate and give you a motivation on why are we actually going to do a rewrite? <laughs> um, and uh, then try to give you a heads up of, okay, so what is this sea of storage spaces that we are talking about? Um, some of the native storage integrations and what that actually means, what is a storage actually? Um, how do we plan to scale this? Uh, why is it called infinite scale? And uh, also give you um, the latest um, resources for a parallel deployment where you can actually run own Cloud 10 in parallel with um, OSIS. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry that Michael Bartz can't be here, but he caught, I know, this kindergarten flu <laughs> that uh, hits yeah, families with young kids every year again and again and again. And so he's really sorry. That, he's also sorry that he can't be here, but uh, yeah, he's driving this as well uh, as I am. And so I try to do my best, best to um, compensate for him. Um, so yeah, never do a rewrite. I mean, everybody has heard this, this uh, yeah, you must be fools if you can think that you can rewrite your old, your old software. And um, there are truths to that and there are um, uh, good reasons when, or th there's a way to actually do a rewrite. You can pull that off if you are well prepared and if the right stuff can happen, if the, if the moon is aligned correctly. In our case, we were pretty lucky. Uh, so, I hope that you all know or that we've established that there are some pain points in Oncloud 10. And uh, so we felt that there are a lot of good reasons. Just, oh, we want to switch to Golang is is not part of that. Um, we actually investigated uh, or I investigated Swoolly PHP, which is also uh, something that tries to emulate the concurrency model of, of Golang and other languages. Um, but uh, it turns out that if you really want to leverage the concurrency, you're block blocked by the underlying drivers, um, for example, for Redis, for MySQL. Um, so all these frameworks that use uh, concurrent execution and parallel execution um, write their own storage drivers for Redis and MySQL because the storage or these, these drivers in PHP are not um, thread safe. Uh, and they are using blocking I.O. They are thread safe, but they're using blocking I.O. So that's why they all these frameworks that use asynchronous execution write their own drivers. Uh, so then we thought, okay, maybe that is too too limiting. Maybe we should look at a different language. And actually, uh, that's we didn't start that. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, CERN has already looked into writing a backend uh, in, in, in Golang for a long time. And we were in a lucky position that we could stand on their giant shoulders. Um, and we also have a very extensive test suite that allows us to completely end-to-end -end test what is working, what is not working, including federated sharing and, and quite a lot. Um, and we are um, so that is prepared. Um, we have an experienced team. We have developers uh, from Oncloud 10, from the desktop team. So the team is is broadly uh, set up. We it's not like that. This is not driven by a new team that tries to make everything better. So, but there are really some old, uh, let's say, Oncloud gurus uh, in the team that really know what they're doing with the code base and that have seen the problems and that can tell you why certain pieces in OnCloud 10 are like they are. Um, we are also in the lucky position that since we have this huge test suite, we can actually run these things in parallel. And that's also one of the migration strategies that you can run OnCloud 10 and OSIS in parallel. And the proxy that sits in front of all that can switch on a user, on a per user basis um, and, and route users either to OnCloud 10 or to OSIS. OSIS um, for yeah, migration purposes, early adopters, and this kind of thing. Um, and 
uh, if you're, you really need to be willing to bug, to be bug compatible with the old product. So when implementing OSIS, we, we ran into a few cases where we saw, oh, this is weird. This is actually bug in the API, the old OnCloud 10 web dev API. And we agreed to, okay, let's reproduce that bug because clients currently parse it like it is. Uh, one example is checksums, but yeah. Um, so, but let's go on to what we want to avoid when in the rewrite. So OnCloud 10 actually is a complete identity management. It comes with all different kinds of authentication and um, um, user backend mechanisms. And this is, from a complexity point, this is a complete identity management solution. I mean, even for the desktop client, we are an OAuth 2 provider. Um, but the problem is it's um, we don't really have a user ID. We just have usernames, but no IDs. And that really makes renaming users impossible. All over the database, we use a username as a reference. So in in kind uh, wherever there should we have should have used a foreign key, we were using the username. So shares contain the username. Um, and that is really that really makes it hard to to um, cleanly um, yeah, to clean up the database when something changes. And it kind of makes the identity management part, questionable so i mean there are other solutions out there um like keycloak or an active directory <laughs> or um, whatever you identity management you want um they spend an enormous amount of time on user management and can't we just focus on file sync and share because that's what we want to do so let's take that out which is just an example of okay a lot of stuff is in oakla 10 where there are um, um, better, better alternatives um, that we aim to use in OSIS. Um, regarding scripting languages and compiled code, um, it's really, you can endlessly debate, do you want to switch or not? Um, but uh, for us, it's really, we've seen a lot of problems deploying own cloud 10 in, in, in production where uh, you were hidden behind firewalls, you couldn't download dependencies um, or the dependencies of PHP were not available in the right version or a specific package wasn't available or you needed to compile um, a driver for um, Oracle. And that really, is makes it really hard to deploy OSIS in certain environments. Um, in the future, we will just have a single binary. You can deploy it and you can configure it. And that should, should make these things easier. Um, also with the, uh, with a binary, with a binary, uh, we, so the script is not, ah, we dug into that. Um, so you cannot set a, the set user ID bit is ignored on script files. And it's also true for, for PHP. If you really want to integrate with the operating system and um, you know create files as the user, as the owner uh, that is logged in, the user needs to be available in, in the operating system, typically via LDAP. Um, but then you can actually use ACLs and um, that's easier with um, a binary that can uh, have the right uh, capability set so that the kernel can allow uh, us to uh, impersonate other users on an OS level. Um, also, uh, modern PHP development very often uses a, a, a queue in the background that executes stuff asynchronously, um, which really is um, not something that shared hosters do or allow you to do. Um, and it felt uh, cleaner to really switch the language to um, a language that is built around concurrency, writing web applications, and has some uh, very important guiding principles for the language that uh, we, as we want to um, build a long living product and you know um, make the code readable and understandable. 
we really uh, like the principles there, like simplicity, readability, and productivity. So that's um, two points um, that are that we really want to do. But um, the more imp important ones, like okay, a sea of storage spaces and others, um, are what really matters. Um, so if you take a step back and imagine your desktop client, what are you actually seeing from desktop client view? You see currently in OnCloud 10, um, you see in OnCloud one endpoint, you see uh, the web remote PHP slash web dev endpoint or the dev files and the username endpoint. And that's it. And that's a logical view into everything that you have access to all the knowledge lives in the um, in the own cloud uh, on the own cloud server side. The own cloud server side assembles a tree for you, including all shares or uh, external uh, storages that are configured on the server side, um, and that is very limiting um, because we currently cannot get the free space under an arbitrary path. Because on the server side, you can always mount a different partition somewhere or a bucket uh, and, and, and uh, mount um, an external file system in a user's tree. But um, that will nowhere be reflected in your quota, for example. You don't know where the permissions change. So that's um, it's hiding details on the server side. And um, another limitation is that you currently cannot yeah, browse a share that somebody gave you without really accepting it. But the moment you accept it on OCloud 10, the desktop client will sync it. Maybe that's malicious data. Um, maybe just don't want it. Um, so it, because it's too much. Um, so yeah, some drawbacks in the API and stuff. So. We thought, okay, let's let's recognize that you know if you think about your home folder, there there's always in slash home there's a username, and only then you will see your files. And on your machines and on, on the servers that you have access to, you all know that there is not one partition or there that really. It's a little bit smaller, a far more fine grain. It's not one big table. There's every user has his own folder. Usually, group drives or project drives exist. I mean, the first thing that every customer built uh, for himself was a some kind of group drive functionality with uh, system users, and that would be shared to all the members of a group. Um, but I think we can do better. Um, and the sea of storage spaces really tries to recognize that, okay, um, there are certain storage spaces and it doesn't really matter where they are, um, but we should treat, um, we, should rec we should recognize that they exist and treat them as a first uh, order concept. So um, they should be addressable, they should have an ID and we should um, be able to the desktop client should be able to get a list of all storage spaces that they have access to. Um, because then they will be able to not only uh, get the e tag of all the roots of the storage spaces, but also um, the quota information, maybe even who shared, uh, who changed something at the latest in, in a certain storage space. And um, if we shard at the API level and um, move the metadata as close, as close to storage as possible, we can get rid of a database because a storage space will not grow as large as um, as a uh, yeah, as the OnCloud 10 database um, because the OnCloud 10 database contains or duplicates the metadata for all storages. Um, so if we shard that on a space level, we can get a long way. Um, this sea of storage space um, has some technical um, consequences. Every storage space has its own web dev endpoint. Um, 
So we started introducing a slash dev slash spaces slash storage space ID endpoint. Um, and that can that works exactly like the, the existing endpoint. It, it can be used to directly access, access that storage point via WebDAV. Um, it's authenticated using OpenID Connect. Um, but it doesn't really need to remain on the same domain as OSIS. So this can be, this is the first step towards a federation. So the storage spaces can reside anywhere as long as you have the URL, the desktop client can sync it. Um, so based on, on eTag, so that's all that's all working. Um, and if we are using, if we are treating these storage spaces as first or uh, concepts, desktop and mobile clients can organize them in a way that best fits the uh, user experience on these devices. iOS usually, you know, groups stuff in, in or puts stuff in lists and allows you to um, uh, group stuff, um, group items in, in, in lists by type or something. And that very neatly aligns with uh, being able to list the specific storage spaces that a user has access to. Um, so how do you actually list storage spaces? Um, we introduced the, we are going to introduce a new endpoint uh, inspired by the Microsoft Graph API, which is using the OData specification to actually um, to describe how the REST JSON API works. So it's REST JSON, it's no longer web dev. Um, and it includes, um, it describes how to paginate, how to, um, for example, make long polling. Uh, so you can send a prefer header. Um, which would allow us to long poll and actually, uh, yeah, get or push notifications to the client easier. Uh, it's even properly specified how to add um, web sockets to this, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, the list of drives that a user has access to um, really only uh, lists the drive that you have access to. Um, there are so we have a roles and permission system that it would allow administrators to list all the drives uh, on a different endpoint, just the drives endpoint. But that's uh, driven by the roles and permission system that we're adding. Um, furthermore, while there might be you know, well, typically you currently connect your desktop client to one instance. Uh, my Personal desktop client is connected to, I think, three deployments: the the one from work, my personal one, and an exper experimental one for uh, OSIS. Um, and in the future, um, you could have each of these would have their own um, endpoint to list the device that I have access to, but it would also be possible to mix um, the drives and the or the, the, the storage spaces that I have access to with arbitrary, regis arbitrary registries. Uh, let me see if I can visualize that for you. So if you think there is, yeah, there is an infinite number of storage spaces around um, and um, there are you know, people that want to access these storages, the question is where do they get the uh, information of where these storages are, the web dev URLs for these storages actually are. Um, and for that, they are going to talk to um, registries. So the first step is always you, you, your desktop client pings the registry, hey, where do you have access to? Um, I have to wait for the slides, I think. Um, the desktop client um, pings a registry and tries to list all storages that a certain user has access to. And then he will get in the list the e-tags of all these storage spaces so that he only needs to um, sync the ones that have changed. Um, and in some cases, a desktop client may talk to more than one registry. Um, so this is a broad overview. I tried to depict this, um, that it's really doesn't matter where your registry is or where your storage providers are. Um, 
and in the future there will not only be storage providers or registries but there might also be other services that work with your data if you uh, delegate the permissions to them but that is uh, future talk i think uh, i will go to qa right now so if you have any questions i will be there and uh, there will be a lunch break in five minutes um, but uh, and then we will see each other again in uh, at 1 p.m uh, german standard time um, until then uh, i will see you in q a and i'm uh, waiting for your questions thanks see you there